My name is Liesl Chapman, and I'm a uh, instructor at North House Folk School. I teach coal roasting there. I also teach at the um, Women's Woodshop uh, in Minneapolis, where I live, and at the American Swedish Institute. So my name is Liesl. I'm also known as at Ch Riv Chica Warrior on uh, Instagram, so you can also find me there as well. And I would like to introduce you to the spectacular, fun, intimate craft technique called coal roasting. So what is coal roasting? Coal roasting uh, is a Norwegian word uh, that I learned from Harley Refsal, and it means writing with coal, coal roasting. And it's different than other forms of decorative arts on spoons and things like that in that you don't remove wood, you just incise, you cut into the wood and fill that with pigment and then burnish it over and it uh, makes a very smooth surface. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of coal roasting from pretty simple ones to more complex designs. Here's a butter spreader that just has a simple coal roasting pattern on it. Straight lines, flat surface, easy to do. Here's another one with straight lines. This is kind of a fun spoon made by Charlie Littlebird. Kind of a fun, fun technique there. One last one of kind of simple designs. Here's just a border on the handle of a kayak style spoon that I carved. And then you can do more complex kinds of things. You can do illustrations. Here's a spoon I carved with a feather on it. I call this my feather spoon. You can also use this to put your mark on the back of spoons. That's my mark. You can do more complex kinds of drawings. This is a portrait of the North Shore, shoreline up near uh, Grand Marais. And you can do lettering. This one is an unfinished spoon, but it's on boxwood, or box elder, excuse me. So it's very bright. And this one was simmered in milk before I worked on it, which filled kind of the end grain. So a nice, pretty, uh, form and here I have um, a window, uh, so to speak, of where I'm going to coal roast on the center of here. It's all framed out with patterns on it. And you can do more complex things. Here's the feather with wood on it. And then this one also has lettering on the back special date, has some fun border patterns on it. So you can do lots of it. This one's darker because the pigment rubbed into the end grain. So that's in contrast with this one on a lighter wood with the treatment of milk so that this was, um, the end grain was filled in more. Just a couple more examples. This is a coal roasting friend of mine, Ty Thornack, and this is a great spoon that he did. And you can do it in the bowl. Which brings me to one of the really nice things about coal roasting is that because it's not chip carving in the way that this is chip carving right here, that on a spoon where you're eating food, all this chip carving could fill with mashed potatoes and peas and gravy, and then it would be hard to get out. But because coal roasting is smooth, you not only can do it on the handles, you can do it on the bowl of the spoon as well. Uh, I have a spoon here that, um, that, I patterned after an old spoon um, 
this is exact pattern of an old Norwegian spoon that I have. Um, we can see the style of spoon and I haven't finished the handle yet. Um, but this is, this is a, a, a very much a direct copy of a Scandinavian spoon. You can also do some very complex things with coal roasting. Um, this form of peculiar spoon, I call it a splate, uh, because it's, it's like a cocktail napkin um, that I can hold like this and I can put food on it and uh, double dip for hummus and stuff like that. And I made a, a Celtic dog after my dog Jocko. And this is a very ornate coal roasting. And coal roasting allows you to do an ornate pattern like that. So you can get very detailed um, with coal roasting. How do you coal roast? What does it look like? You use a coal roasting knife. Uh, this is a coal roasting knife. It's made by Dell Stubbs. Uh, it has this sheath that looks like a thimble. I pull it out and this is the blade of the coal roasting knife. So you can see it's a very wide bevel. If you look at that, the bevel part of it, and then it's slightly curved this direction and that helps you turn in the wood. Uh, this is available from Pinewood Forge. Uh, Dell Stubbs is the knife maker. We are so lucky that he makes these knives. It's not easy to find a good coal roasting knife and these are affordable. They're, um, I'm, I'm gonna say under $30 and probably more like $25. Um, so this is a very inexpensive, uh, in the world of knives, handmade coal roasting knife to get. It's good, it's not expensive, and they're hard to find. So, Pinewood Forge Dell Stubbs. So I'm gonna put the cap back on that. I have taken um, my coal roasting knife by Dell Stubbs, and I've modified it. I've cut off the handle here so that it's shorter, and I played around with the with the sheath here, and then I coal roast the coal roasting knife. So um, I made it short so that I can travel with it. And I wanna show you how portable coal roasting is. This right here is my coal roasting wallet, and I can keep everything that I need to coal roast in this little tiny zipped pouch made by Fisker Joe of wolfskin, tanned wolfskin fish. Uh, you can find him on the internet at uh, uh, Instagram at Fisker Joe. So my coal roasting knife fits in there. Then I want to have some pigment. I have a little bag of cinnamon. That fits right in there. I have a pencil. This is a folding pencil. Any kind of pencil that you get at the co-op or the grocery store or at golf, you know, those little, those little tiny pencils will work. This one folds like that. Fits right in there. Then I have a burnisher, and I'll explain how a burnisher works. This is a piece of antler. Fits right in there. I have a little vial of oil. Fits in there. And I have a little scrap of cloth to clean things up. And voila, zip it right up. And I can just put that in my pocket and coal roast anywhere. So this is a really portable, great craft to learn and makes things beautiful. So what are the techniques involved in coal roasting? Um, I'm going to uh, show you a couple of critical things. And one is grips and then how to um, finish the coal roasting. What are the, the steps involved? So the first thing is have good glasses on. Have magnifying glasses. It's hard to see what you're doing. I recommend having raked light or doing out, it out in the sunlight. Um, have good lighting so that you can see because as you work, before you get the pigment in, uh, it's gonna be very hard to see the cut lines. So. You've seen the equipment, 
good lighting, magnifying glasses if you have them, and um, then you need to learn Kohlrossing grips. Now the thing about, and I'm going to use this long one so that you can see what I'm talking about, the thing with a Kohlrossing knife is that you tend to think of it just as a pencil, but it's a knife. So you want to be attention, attentive to Kohlrossing grips. And I'm going to switch this way so that you can see my right hand really clearly. And I like to practice on tongue depressors because there's, they, they, they're not valuable. So I can just make all the mistakes in the world because when you coal roast on a finished spoon, it's kind of high risk because you're decorating something that's already done. So you want to have good skills behind you. So the technique I use, I'm holding this in my non-dominant hand and I have my thumb in a position I'm gonna, so you can see this way, my fingers wrapped around, my thumb here. And the reason that my thumb is like that is because I don't pull the blade I push the blade. And most coal roasters that I know push the blade with their thumb. They feel like they have the most control that way. So my thumb is ready to push the blade. Second thing is that it's very important as much as possible to have the coal roasting knife perpendicular to the wood. So it doesn't matter what angle my hands are, because this is all like a tight unit here, but the blade perpendicular, straight up and down to the wood. And so not like this, not like this, but straight up and down. And this one's the hardest one for people who think of it as a writing uh, instrument to have it straight up and down, not angled this way or not angled that way. Why is that? It's because if you have it angled, you're actually going to take a slicing cut and that wood could pop out, which is not what you want. You want it to go straight down. And if you do a parallel line next to it, it's for sure going to pop out if you came down straight. And I want to show you an example of what that looks like when it pops out. My partner Aaron is doing the filming here. Let's see if I can get this set up so that you can see the pop-outs in that lettering. And let me point to some right there. Okay, that dark spot there is because the wood popped out because I wasn't good at my technique yet when I was doing that. So back to having it straight. The other thing, well, I'll just show you the, the technique of doing this and then I'm gonna show you something a little bit more. Um, the smoothness of the wood is really important. If you have raggy wood, it just is never gonna look clean. So I don't know what this, uh, what the texture of this tongue depressor is, but for the sake of right now, I just wanna show you how to make the cut. So I've got this lined up as perpendicular as I can my non-dominant hand is bracing the whole thing. I have my little finger usually on the object or on my hand so that my right and left hand are working as a unit. And then I've got my thumb on my non-dominant hand pressed right up against the blade. This hand is just applying downward pressure and making sure that the blade is pointed where I want it to go. So. The blade is facing away from me, and wherever the blade is, wherever the blade is faced is the direction of the cut. And so I've got it all straight, and I'm just going to give it a push. Okay. And I'm going to show you the line, and I'm not sure how well you can see that there. You probably can't see it very well because there's no pigment in it. But that's a straight line there. Now I'm going to take uh, some pigment. In this case, I'm using coffee because it will show up a little darker on what I'm doing. And it'll be a blacker look. Cinnamon is kind of a browner look. And I've got it on my finger. I rub it into the wood. 
And I'm going to rub just a little bit more in there. And now you can see that line. You also see that it's a little muddy back here and that has to do with the finish of this wood. And I'll talk about that more in just a second. So I've got my pigment in there. It's just one cut line. I'm using walnut oil. And in some of my kits, I just keep a nice dropper bottle like this. And here's my line that I just did. And I'm gonna put a drop of oil on there. And I'm gonna rub that in. And then the cut, if I feel that now, it's kind of rough. So this is a cross section of the wood. And here's the cut of chip carving. You remove this whole triangle of piece. In what I'm doing, I just cut a line right there and separated those fibers. The fibers are rough at the top. I put pigment in there. Then I put that drop of oil on it to get that pigment so that it's gonna, um, be a little bit darker and stabilize it in there and then I take a burnishing tool and I rub it really hard and close that up and then I oil it again. So right now I've got the oil there. I'm going to take my burnisher. This is a nice piece of antler um, that's just perfect because my thumb fits right in there but anything that is very smooth and harder than the wood will work. So the back of an ordinary spoon will work. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to rub it. And that will lock that in. If I wanted that to not get into the rest of the wood, um, what I'd need to do is either cut it with a, with a, you know, like a, like a planing cut with a really, really sharp knife. So it gives you that beautiful finish. I could sand it with very, very fine sandpaper or I could um, oil it first, set it aside, let that oil cure, and then come back and do it. And then the one that gives you the most contrast, that was this spoon was simmered in milk for um, probably about 20 minutes, uh, non-fat milk, you want no fat in it, simmer for about 20 minutes, rub it off, let it dry, oil it, and, and then go over it, and that really blocks the blocks the open grain on it. Um, for a curved cut, and this is the last thing that I'll show you, how you do with a curved cut, same grip, like this, but here I'm turning the blade. Remember wherever the blade is pointed is where it'll go. So I have it now aimed this direction and I'm gonna turn it as I go, and I'm gonna give it a push with my thumb, and I'm turning, 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 and as it comes around, I might even slide my thumb behind and go around there. I kinda of push it in as I end that stroke. You can't see that line really right now because it doesn't have pigment in it. So I'm gonna put, again, coffee in it. I'm gonna rub it right in there. Now you can see that line, drop of oil on it, rub that oil in, burnish it, and again if I had treated this wood first I wouldn't have all of that end grain, uh, the, the open grain filled up. Um, but sometimes that look is kind of nice. So this spoon right here has a lot of end grain um, that the cinnamon went into and it kind of makes it look antiqued or stained. So it's up to you um, what you like there. And it's also one of the reasons I like cinnamon. It's just a little more forgiving than coffee. So that, my friends, is coal roasting basics. Um, practice on flat before you practice on curved surfaces. There are different techniques that are needed for curved surfaces. Um, 
which uh, maybe if I do another one of these, we'll, we'll do uh, curved surfaces. And practicing on dowels is really good practice for that. I want to show you um, one of my students' work practicing on a tongue depressor, practicing patterns on a tongue depressor, and then taking the next step and doing that on a dowel, which is harder. So this is, these are really great practicing exercises. And then she also had a practice board for doing lettering um, and patterns. And from that, you can move to, um, to doing spoons. Practice first before you head to, to spoons because like I said, coal roasting is a high, high risk endeavor because you're working on finished stuff and it's easy to make overcuts with coal roasting. So if you, if you take it on, practice stopping and starting where you want to stop and start because if you have overcuts, you know, it's pretty easy to turn a P into a B if you make one of them a line too long or vice versa. So practice, and uh, I hope to, I hope uh, you follow me on Instagram at Riv Chica Warrior. I hope to see you in a class sometime, whether it's virtual or in person, and uh, have fun coal roasting, because it's a really, it's a really nice thing, and remember, it all fits in a wallet. So thanks for watching. Be well, be strong, be kind.